This is Amateur Logic, episode 156 for May 15th, 2021. This episode of Amateur Logic is brought to you by MFJ, the world leaders in amateur radio accessories. And by ICOM. Get outside and under the stars with one of ICOM's ultimate SDR transceivers. Good evening, and welcome to another episode of Amateur Logic. I'm George. I'm Tommy. I'm Emil. And I'm Mike. And Mike. So you can see what kind of show it's going to be tonight. This is the first, well, I guess, show that we've had with two people in the studio here for Amateur Logic. Yeah. Since since a year or more than a year. A little over a year. Yeah. It seems really weird, too, to be honest with you. It does. Let me let me know if you need some more of this hand sanitizer. Okay, yeah, you better freshen me up here a little bit. <laughs> so what are you going to talk about, Emil? I have a forum, a Facebook forum post from Nick Gavin, and he is a new technician that's been watching you guys. So there you go. You're, uh, you're getting that uh, word out there. Creating new hams. Uh, there you go. KF zero FLR, I believe, is the call. And Nick wrote to us and said, "So last night, after failing three previous times, I finally passed my tech test. What are some things I should start with once I get my call sign?" So he came to the forum here, and there are 28 comments on this uh, post here with plenty of. Uh, advice and information and the one that stuck out to me professor is the last sentence in your comment to Nick was if you could locate another ham in the area that will be a big help and the comment right after that from uh, Bob also said find a local radio club more than one those two really stuck out to me because a lot of people were giving them all sorts of advice including me about HF and privileges and things that would really pile on really quick but uh, those two comments I thought stuck out pretty good so congratulations to uh, Nick for getting his ticket and becoming a tech congrats yeah congrats Nick and yeah, welcome congrats. to the club and one of, one of the things about the clubs uh, uh, meeting typically virtually these days uh, anybody can join in from anywhere and uh, most clubs welcome anyone to join in to their meetings. So it's kind of an opportune time. It is. Oh, yeah. I had not thought about that, but you're right, Mike. Yeah, things, a lot of things have changed. I actually did a, a club meeting uh, over Zoom. Zoom? A while back, yeah. Yeah. About a month and a half, maybe two months back. Well, tonight <laughs> I've got a segment here I want to share with you. There's something that... Apparently, it's been around a while, and I did not know about it. I mean, we've been doing digital stuff over the radio for for quite a while, but I didn't know how much shortwave radio was involved in this, too. And I just happened to stumble upon something. And I said, I've got to try that out. And I did. And you did. And here's, How does it work out for you? Well, let's see. Okay. What is a radiogram? According to Cambridge Dictionary, it's an image made using X-rays or other rays. Wikipedia says, in British English, a radiogram is a piece of furniture that combines a radio and a record player. The word radiogram is a portmanteau of radio and gramophone. In American English, we call that a console. With the Radiogram Android app, you can listen to radio stations on your phone or tablet. No aerial is required, 
only an internet connection. Or perhaps a radiogram is a formal written message transmitted by a radio, also known as a radio telegram or radio telegraphic message. Here is an early radiogram sent to President FDR from RCA on December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. An ARRL radiogram is the instance of a formal written traffic message routed by a network of amateur radio operators through the traffic net called the National Traffic System. However, today we're going to be looking at a different type of radiogram. Shortwave radiogram transmits digital text and images via analog shortwave broadcast transmitters. The program is produced and presented by Dr. Kim Andrew Elliott for you to decode the digital text and images. Most listeners choose FL Digi for a PC or the TIVAR app for Android devices. You can learn more about shortwave radiogram at swradiogram.net. There you will find a schedule of the times, dates, stations, and frequencies. I like to record the broadcast directly using my IC7700. This gives me the option to record and try decoding as many times and with as many apps as I would like. I used FL Digi here with a Raspberry Pi 400. The first thing you need to do is select the mode that will be transmitted. That will change at different times on different weeks. The week I recorded here for demonstration, they were using MFSK32 and MFSK64 to do text, HTML, and images. Let's take a look at how this works. Program 195 of Shortwave Radio Gram. I'm Kim Andrew Elliott, Arlington, Virginia, USA. On shortwave radio gram, we transmit digital text and images on an analog shortwave broadcast transmitter. For more information about our project, visit swradiogram.net. That's swradiogram.net. On today's program, text in MFSK32 and MFSK64. News about the discovery of the most distant quasar with powerful radio jets. A story in HTML format about a car battery swapping company and our images of the week. First, the program preview in MFSK32. That's MFSK32. The program began with a short introduction and a lineup of what will be in this particular program. They were on episode 195. I had no idea this program had been airing that long. In this episode, they're presenting a story on the most distant quasar using MFSK32. Then, they switch to MFSK64 and do a story on an automated battery swap station. It is formatted in HTML. Also in MFSK64 will be Images of the Week. Then they'll switch back to MFSK32 for the closing announcement. After a few minutes, I received the entire Quasar article with no errors. This was kind of surprising to me because the signal was fading in and out throughout the transmission. Next, they displayed a message alerting us to switch to MFSK64 mode. I was a little slow doing this, but didn't miss the message. Once this mode begins, you can tell the data is coming down a lot faster just by the way it sounds. And you can see it's displayed faster on the screen as well.
This message was delivered with HTML tags. That means we'll have a message suitable for viewing in a web browser. Once all the text is received, we'll want to copy everything between the line with doc type HTML at its beginning and the line with slash HTML at its end. We'll place this into a text editor. You'll want to use a text editor like Notepad, not a word processor, because a word processor might strip out the HTML tags. In FL Digi, it's probably easiest to right-click Select All, then copy and paste it into your text editor. Once you've got it in your text editor, you can delete everything before the doc type tag and after the slash HTML tag. Then save this with the .html extension. Now you can open it with a web browser. You'll have a formatted web page of what we just received. On this particular week's shortwave radiogram, they also transmitted a series of pictures, and I believe they do that most weeks. These are all lower resolution photos, so that they'll transmit quicker. And I've speeded up the playback time here because of time constraints. This is a rare yellow cardinal. It's not a separate species, but a genetic mutation of a common red cardinal. There were several other images sent, like this winner of the Black and White Minimalist Photography Award, this lava lake in the Democratic Republic of Congo, this pair of hooters, a picture of a boat on the River Orwell in England, a riverside in Inverness, Scotland under a full moon. You can see the signal fade near the middle of the transmission of the image. Sundown in Scotland, and the painting of the week from 1904, a girl resting against a haystack. If you're looking for fun radio activity, you might want to check out Shortwave Radiogram by going to swradiogram.net. There you'll find all the details, as well as what's going to be in the next show, and where and when to tune in. This was a lot of fun, and I'm definitely going to do it again. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, you what, did. What did you see in the picture? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. I was just, you know... How did you do it with a straight face? Because you didn't even crack up when you said it. You didn't see my face. That was <laughs> I did it like ten takes, and that's the one I didn't. And I was cracking up a couple episodes ago when you said "nice rack." Yeah. <laughs> well, and it was. <laughs> and and that was actually a pair of owls there that we just yeah. saw for those watching on the can't argue or with listening, that. Without those not watching yeah. the video. Yeah, but it's a nice house. Actually, maybe we should put the T-shirts in the uh, in the in the swag shop with the two owls on them. Yeah, <laughs> we'll make them orange. That was funny. Well, that was a lot of fun, and you know, all those those they only did MFSK thirty two and sixty four. Uh huh. But you can do those modes on ham radio. Oh yeah, it was pretty cool. 
Uh, yeah, I, that was really was cool. cool. Yeah. And who do you think their target audience is for for that kind of decoding? Um, short, short do you think wave. the average uh, shortwave listener is uh, decoding those uh, radiograms? I think it's possible, you know, because, you know, anyone listening to shortwave, maybe they're um, part of it is the experience, and if they've got a computer, the software is uh, cost-compliant. So I, I think, yeah, anybody, whether you're a ham or not, you might want to check that out. You know, that that was fun stuff. And that is really cool. Yeah. I didn't know it existed either. Yeah. You're right, George. How long do you think they've been doing that for? Because um, I know my uh, world radio uh, TV handbook is a, a little out of date, but uh, there was nothing like that in, in the edition that I have. Uh, that was episode 195, and they do it, I believe, once a week, so... Uh, oh, wow. A couple ago. years then. Yeah. They not always send it in HTML format, um, but, you know, there's there's plenty of different things they're doing there. And, yeah, you just got to follow them. I think they have a either a Facebook or, a, or their own website for them where they tell you what they're going to do in advance. They do. And, yeah, you'll know what's going to happen. And if you know the mode they start out with, they post everything else there. I've been looking for a used vehicle. And I think you found something that yeah. might suit the bill. Well, I got a, actually I got a PSA from my friend Scott Wall. She posted it in uh, Facebook. It says how to kidnap a radio amateur. But if you're a ham and you find yourself down by the river and uh, you see a van that says free ham radios, you may want to stay away from it. It's a van down by the river? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's my best Chris Farley voice. I need to work on it. Those skits were great. Yeah. But anyway, I thought that was pretty funny. We got a lot more to go. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Do you need an HF antenna choice that's compact yet efficient? Then check out the new MFJ 1835 cobweb antenna. It's a five-band, one-half-wave antenna that's perfect for restricted spaces or portable operation. This cobweb antenna design is five one-half-wave open-loop wire antennas in one covering 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10 meters, and it handles up to 300 watts. The sky-gray fiberglass spreaders and nearly invisible wire elements blend in with your surroundings while standing tough against nasty weather. The MFJ1835 is horizontally polarized for less local noise pickup, plus it gives you solid gain over vertical antennas, up to 5 dBi gain for working DX easily, even at QRP power levels. There's no need for ground radials with this antenna, Connect your coax to the SO239 feed point and you'll get low SWR with MFJ's exclusive Spider Match broadband network. The radiation pattern is nearly omnidirectional, so you won't need a rotator. Better yet, it measures only 13 feet diagonally and weighs in at just 8 pounds, which allows you to mount it with lightweight TV antenna hardware to your chimney, balcony, fence post, or most any convenient location. Don't let limited space keep you off the HF bands. Get on the air now with the MFJ 1835 Cobweb Half-Wave 5-Band Antenna. For more information on this and all the other fine MFJ products, visit MFJEnterprises.com today. And that was a good point, Tommy. You mentioned right... Uh yeah, I was wondering if that's somebody's wife that drove that van down by the river. That could be. I could see that <laughs> being free radios. Yeah. yeah, that's probably the only way you're going to find a free one. Yeah. Well, let's see. Where are we next here on the show tonight? Email. You have been working on a project that I think is near and dear to your heart. I really came to... Uh need or have a few needs this time if I'm going to continue my digital uh, field operations out there, especially when you're not connected to anything. You don't want to be or, you're, or you can't because uh, 
some hurricane decided to come through and wipe us all, all of our infrastructure out down here. I needed a way to sync my time and also uh, get positions. And I come up with a little device here that some people might be familiar with to help me out with that. So that's what my segment's all about. Hello, George, Tommy, Mike, Amateur Logic TV viewers. Today, I'm going to show you a cheap solution for setting the time on a laptop as well as getting GPS positions to send through the Winlink system or maybe other applications you might have when you're not connected to anything and getting that information out there. The device in question I'm going to be talking about is the the GPS GLONASS UBlock 7 GPS dongle and this device which is about $15 available on Amazon or other places it is a cheap solution that can set your time in this case I'm going to use it with the WinLink system on Windows 10 but it does work with Raspberry Pis I've actually tested it out with my Pi Star image as well so it works on the COM port. It's plugged in right now. I'll go ahead and show you that. Device manager. So here it is as a COM port. In my case, COM3. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up WinLink Express and show you how you would go about using that uh, USB GPS dongle. Under the settings menu, there's a GPS position and reports item in the WinLink Express software. And when you pick that, you would pick the COM port in question. In my case, the GPS baud rate that it communicates on is 9600 baud. And here you can see it's communicating data constantly, every second, basically, to the computer via that COM port. So if I click the Use GPS button and Use Current Time button here, I'm going to have a position with time ready to go. So if I hit post report, it goes ahead and it puts in my outbox that message, which I can then in turn send via a local packet system that we have here. Go ahead and um, pick one. My uh, In my case, it's a K5PRC-10 Digipeter or Winlink Gateway off of a Digipeter that we have here in Slidell. Pretty high up there, 600 feet. And that nickname is SIL. So if I go ahead and hit start, you'll hear this conversation taking place. It's connected up to the Pearl River County. Winlink Gateway. And there you go, the message. I actually received the message as well in my uh, thing. I, I sent one earlier, and you'll see that here. And it's probably a duplicate packet. I've sent one recently. So, uh, But you will see in the actual WinLink system there, their position reports. You can see there my text of the U-Blocks 
GPS GLONASS auto position report sent via packet that's something I uh, put in there just to make sure it was making it but they have a positions report site themselves which other people who might not be in an affected area can get to to see where you are or where you're reporting if you're reporting so um, there you go using a, a cheap GPS in the WinLink system in my case we, we have packet gateways of course you can use any of the others to do the same thing uh, HF gateways um, the Telnet gateways so there's many ways to use this system another thing here that you can do especially if you're out in the field let's say field day is to sync your time from the GPS system directly from this little device here and of course set my computer's time to it again same thing here BKT time sync software that's free of course and you can also specify the COM port serial port serial rate and how it's going to talk to this uh, device you can see here some of the last times it synced and I can tell it of course always to sync now 0.004 seconds offset so now my clock on the computer here is going to be set to uh, GPS time there's some things you can do if you're out of touch with the rest of the world and those satellites are still floating around up there then uh, you can get some things done with them with a $15 USB dongle and of course the PC that it's in or a Raspberry Pi uh, the Windows 10 edition of this does uh, require a driver of course that's free and you can download it it comes with its own software as well the Pi doesn't require a driver or Linux that just works 7.3 KE5 QKR Arnie wanted to know if it relies on the Russian GLONASS information or the US GPS system. The GLONASS, G L O N A S. Yeah. Um, so it'll use it'll use so it comes with a software that you can configure the thing with uh, and you, you can basically tell it what you want it to do. Uh, I've noticed that inside it takes about 45 seconds to sync to sync up um, and that's from inside the house but it's uh it'll it'll it does pretty good I was surprised that it works inside so yeah both yes all the all of the above and we know with the digital modes you know how important it is to get some of these modes uh, within a second of accuracy mm -hmm. right so yeah. you kind of have to uh, you need something while out there in the field so I thought I would give this a try and it just worked Nice, and I just figured out how to do it for nothing by using my old Garmin GPS 2 Plus that has a, a NEMA serial output on it. You mean Repo Clause hasn't come to claim that yet? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Field day is coming up, right? So that's, that's, that was the uh, impetus behind my wanting to do that is just to make sure I got that thing. And they apparently... They're going to go ahead and, uh, speaking of field day, extend those rules. You know how they have the special rules where you can combine your scores and operate from pretty much anywhere, oh. but you can combine your scores as a group for your club. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, they're carrying out all, all that over again this year. So I wonder if that's going to be a norm going forward. I don't know. Well, Mike? You actually have an email this time around rather than some social media post. This one comes from Steven, and, and I'll give you his call sign, Kilo Oscar 4, November Oscar Papa. And he writes, Hi, Mike. After years of watching Tommy and George, and more recently you and Emil, on and off via the Roku app, I recently buckled down and got my technician ticket. So great. My first contact, you were in control at the time could combine amateur logic and one of my favorite TV shows, Last Man Standing. Echo Link is great. I need to get my general so I can play for real next time. You guys do a great job, and thanks for bringing me into the hobby. Steve, Kilo Oscar 4, November Oscar Papa. 
Thanks, Steve, and uh, congratulations. Yeah, congrats, Steve. And, uh, you know, even a technician can play in the game, you know, and it counts. So, That's yeah. right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mike's got a segment we're going to look at here in just a moment. You've been back playing on the web again, I see. So you, you, can, I have. you can tell us about that when we come right back. The great outdoors is calling. Get outside and under the stars with one of ICOM's ultimate SDR transceivers. Stay connected while off the grid. The IC705 is a perfect transceiver for hams who want to enjoy both the great indoors and outdoors. It's the perfect QRP companion. This transceiver has features and functions at the tips of your fingers in a portable package covering HF, 6 meters, 2 meters, 70 centimeters, and the weight is just under 2 pounds. 4.3 inch color touchscreen with live band scope and waterfall. 5 watts with BP272 battery or 10 watts with 13.8 volts DC input. Create your own band opening with the IC9700. This transceiver brings direct sampling to the VHF UHF weak signal world. This all mode transceiver is loaded with innovative features that are sure to keep you busy. 4.3 inch color touchscreen with real time high speed spectrum scope and waterfall display. Smooth satellite operation with 99 satellite channels. And it supports dual watch operation and full duplex operation in satellite mode. Visually sees the VHF UHF world with ICOM's IC9700. Heard it, worked it, logged it. ICOM's IC7300 is a high performance, innovative HF transceiver with a compact design that will far exceed your expectations. This innovative HF transceiver digitizes RF before various receiver stages to reduce the generated inherent noise in different IF stages. ICOM's IC7300 is a radio that changed the way entry-level HF is designed. Visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. Nice. Tommy, you're waiting on an ICOM product to come in right now, yeah, aren't you? Yeah, I'm an AH705 tuner. Yeah. You yeah, got one nice. on order. Can't wait for it to get here. It's I going. wonder if that uh, 705 over time will uh, will beat the sales records for the 7300 or yeah of the 7300 um, because it's it's so popular right now and I don't see it dropping off anytime soon either. Yeah. I don't know, man. So that 7300 was it's really popular, but the 705 is it's uh it's on fire right now. Well, it is. It keeps them in yeah. stock. It is. Is that because you took it apart, George? It's on fire? <laughs> no, I didn't take the radio part, just the tuner. Uh -huh. <laughs> tuner, okay. Yeah. He, he wouldn't leave the radio uh, around me long enough to, yeah. you know, to take to avoid the warranty. Yeah, avoid the warranty. Yeah, avoid the warranty, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Mike, what have you been up to? I know, like I, I teased it a minute ago, I know you've been back on the web, but explain well yeah, about a year ago i talked about i did it was more of a live kind of demo and i probably should have did the same thing because i ran into some technical difficulties uh with it but uh, anyway long story short a fellow by the name of jacob took over the open web rx project from another fellow ham i think was based in uh hungary mm -hmm. um and he's been running with it ever since. And he just released the first full release, version 1.0.0, uh, last week, as a matter of fact. And uh, it's it's pretty exciting because a lot of the uh, kind of things that uh, a lot of the users found difficult uh, setting up their SDR radios with it had to do with the fact that you had to um, edit uh, actual text files or configuration files manually. And it was a bit of a, a trial and error process uh, because at the time there wasn't a lot of documentation and unless you really knew what you were doing, um, you could things could go wrong pretty quickly. Um, but now what he's done is he's created a GUI interface for the configuration and he's made it uh, kind of a complete package. So 
there's kind of kind of no reason why anybody with uh, an SDR radio such as a SDR dongle or a SDR play uh, and a Raspberry Pi shouldn't be able to uh, to get it up and running now. Last year in Amateur Logic episode 142, I did a live demo on OpenWebRx version 0.18, an orphaned web SDR project that had been recently adopted by Jacob DD5JFK. In this month's episode, we'll take a look at the first full release, version 1.00, and I'll highlight some of the changes in this edition. Here is the required hardware that we'll need. First we'll need a Raspberry Pi Model 3B, 3B Plus, or 4, which I recommend. And we'll also need a micro SD card, class 10 or faster, and 4 gig or larger. An HDMI monitor, USB mouse, and keyboard. We only need this temporarily as we set this up, and it can be removed afterwards. A 5 volt power source, 2.4 amps or better, with a micro USB connector on the end. A micro HDMI to HDMI adapter if you're using a standard cable with a Raspberry Pi 4 and supported SDR device. Let's go to the OpenWebRx site and download the image. I should point out at this point that you can also run OpenWebRx on an Intel Core processor under Ubuntu, Linux or Docker. Next we'll need to format a micro SD memory card to burn our image file on. For this we'll use the SD Association's SD card formatter utility. We'll need a 4 gig or larger class 10 or better micro SD card and adapter to fit your computer. Go ahead and format the SD card but be careful that you are formatting the correct device and ignore and cancel any Windows messages suggesting you to format your SD card or you'll have to start all over again. And lastly, we'll use the Raspberry Pi Foundation's Raspberry Pi Imager app to write the OpenWebRx image onto our microSD card. You can use other imaging applications if you wish, such as Win32 Disk Imager or Belen Etcher, but I have found the Raspberry Pi Imager to work flawlessly, and you don't have to uncompress your image file first, just specify the zip file. Once the image has been written to the micro SD card, eject it from your computer and insert it into the Raspberry Pi. Be sure that the Raspberry Pi is powered off before inserting any devices, especially the micro SD card. As a reminder, always do a pseudo power off or similar before removing the power. With your freshly burned micro SD card inserted, HDMI monitor, USB mouse and keyboard connected, Go ahead and apply power to your Raspberry Pi. Within a few seconds, you should be seeing Linux commands scrolling down the screen as the operating system is loading. The code line should eventually stop and leave you at a command prompt. The default username and password is the standard Pi and Raspberry. Log in with these credentials and you should arrive at the Pi at OpenWebRx command prompt. We need to take care of a few things first, such as setting up your Raspberry Pi for Wi-Fi access if you're not using the wired Ethernet connection, regional settings such as location, time zone, language, and keyboard layout, and also I recommend enabling SSH so that you can manage your Raspberry Pi remotely and lose the HDMI monitor, mouse, and keyboard. The command for this is sudo raspy-config. Go ahead and set up the following settings. I won't go into detail here as there is lots of information on the Raspberry Pi Foundation's website and other sites. Google is your best friend here. For security reasons, Jacob has chosen not to enable a default user account, so you'll need to create one first in order to change settings, etc. You do this at the command line, so before you take away the HDMI monitor, mouse and keyboard, create your user accounts first like this. Okay, let's fire up your web browser and navigate to OpenWebRx. That URL should immediately bring you to a screen similar to this. If I click on the drop down list here, you can tell that I have two devices that are currently connected to my uh, uh, Raspberry Pi 4 that's uh, running OpenWebRx. So I have an RTL SDR dongle. And I also have an SCR Play, and you can see I've got uh, several. Uh, these are defaults, by the way. Uh, some of these uh, band segments have been pre configured, and uh, we'll get into that in a minute. Unfortunately, I can't let you listen to the audio, but it will decode all the various digital modes, including the new M17, which is a new feature on this version. Um, but unfortunately, my screen capture software uh, 
for some reason is conflicting with the audio coming out of OpenWebRx and I'm not able to record it. One other thing I should mention is these are uh, pre-configured uh, bookmarks or you can configure your own bookmark just by clicking the little bookmark symbol down here. You can give it a name and it will actually use the current frequency that you're tuned in on um, and sets the mode up as well. This little status button up here toggles the status on and off and you can see uh, the audio buffer, audio output, audio stream which is currently uh, 48 kilobits per second and my network usage uh, for this particular stream is uh, currently sitting around 280 uh, kilobits per second. Um, you can see my CPU load is currently at 21 percent and that I currently have one client which is me. Um, so on a Raspberry Pi 4, I guess it's a good time to talk about this. Raspberry Pi 4, I haven't done any extensive testing as, as this new version has only been out for, oh, it only came out last week, so I haven't done too much testing. But based on my, my current utilization with one client, um, I estimate that I could probably support uh, three users at one time on, the, on this Raspberry Pi 4. I am told that if you're using a, uh, an Intel iCore processor uh, running, say, Ubuntu or Debian uh, with OpenWebRx, you can support up to about 20 uh, concurrent users. Uh, okay, so that's the status. And if you click on the log button, uh, it will bring up a little bit of information about the, about the developer himself, uh, Jacob, uh, DD5JFK. And uh, there's a hot link here to the OpenWebRx homepage and the group's I.O. mailing list. And if I click on receiver here, that just toggles my, my receiver box on and off. And if I click on map, it will show me a Google map of my location. Let's go back and let's click on settings. And this is really the exciting part of uh, Open WebRx uh, 1.0 uh, because uh, prior to this release there was no uh, actual interface and you had to actually modify or edit a text file for all your devices and uh, the appropriate band segments and and keep in mind an SDR device can only um, manage a small slice of what it's capable of receiving at one time so you have to create various uh, I guess you could call them band segments for each device um, and of course that's going to vary uh, depending on what your device is and what its capabilities are so um, this box here uh, if you remember we created uh, a user account I created a v3mic and I'm just going to enter in a password here and click the login button okay here's the main settings menu and uh, this is where you're going to do your initial setup. So I recommend after you've uh, done your initial setup that we talked about in the video earlier, uh, you're going to go here to the settings and you're going to want to set up, uh, first of all, your general settings. And you can see it's got to your basic uh, information, your location, um, details about the, the actual site of where the receiver is located, uh, elevation in meters above sea level. Um, you can put in a, uh, an email address here, which is handy if you want to have people contact you. You can put an email address in there, your uh, longitude latitude in decimal degrees. Uh, you can put a photo in here. And here's a nice photo of, of the bay uh, in the area that I live. Um, and you can actually uh, change your avatar image as well. The maximum number of, of current clients that uh, that uh, you want to permit uh, to be connected to your OpenWebRx uh, node. And currently I have mine set at three. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff here you probably don't want to change. Just go with the defaults unless you really know what you're doing. This is where you set your tuning precision and you can set all the way down to one hertz if you like. Let's just have a look at some of the other settings here. And we're going to go back to the main menu and this is where you specify your devices and profiles. And you can see that I have an RTL SDR dongle. 
and there's two profiles that are currently set up for that and my SDR play which has five profiles and um, you can add new devices by clicking on this box here uh, we talked about bookmarks earlier if I had uh, bookmarks that I created I can edit them here and I think yes you can even import uh, personal bookmarks as well so uh, you can add new bookmarks as well as delete them from here. This is getting more into the meat and potatoes and again unless you really know what you're doing I don't recommend you change any of these settings until you get more accustomed to using uh, OpenWebRx. Uh, one thing you want to change uh, though is uh, we talked about this on on the most recent uh, segment of ham college we talked about pre-emphasis and de-emphasis and and it's going to be defaulted to 50 because uh, the developer being in Europe um, they're using uh, 50 microseconds over in Europe as opposed to uh, North America which uses 75 microseconds so you can go ahead and change this one but I recommend you uh, you leave the rest alone for now until you get accustomed to knowing what you're doing with it. Um, this is if of interest to those people who are into spotting. Uh, you can set it up so that uh, it reports uh, stations that it's heard. Um, and there's uh, APRS reporting, there's PSK reporting, and there's uh, Whisper uh, reporting. So you can set that up and uh, have have the uh, open webrx uh, report directly to those sites and lastly uh, the feature report which is is probably only going to be of interest to uh, those who uh, have developer skills um, it talks about the various connectors and uh, devices that are used uh, within open uh, open webrx so um, hopefully that's given you a good overview and um, I encourage everybody to set one of these up and uh, go play with it. Um, I wish the band conditions were better that I could uh, better demonstrate uh, some of the some of the decoding on the digital modes anyway and I again I apologize for not being able to uh, to let you listen to any of the audio uh, because of my screen capturing issue. So that's it. I've only scratched the surface today on OpenWebRx 1.0, but I hope that I have provided you with enough information to get your own web-enabled SDR receiver node up and running. Jacob has been working extensively on this project and strives to keep everything up to date on his OpenWebRx GitHub site, including the documentation. I also recommend that you sign up for the OpenWebRx groups.io group for help and information. I've also listed all of the necessary links in the show notes. 7.3 from VE3MIC. That project has come a long way. You know, I did a, a segment on it a long time ago, but it's it's certainly relevant to, to bring it back up again because it's changed so much. Um, but it, it's it's changed quite a lot. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty interesting. I was listening to, uh, uh, to DMR um, and DSTAR today, actually, um, with it. Um, it's certainly not up to the same caliber as, say, something with a hardware vocoder chip, like an Ambi 3000 or 3003. Mm -hmm. But uh, certainly it's it's fully intelligible. Um, and uh, for something that's done completely in software, and, and in particular running on a Raspberry Pi, it's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. It's, it's a cool project. Yeah, it Def is. Definitely had the uh, function to price ratio as well, Mike. Yeah, actually, uh, <laughs> no no expenditures were uh, were spent in order to do this particular project. You're, you're probably familiar with the Kiwi SDRs that folks have uh, made accessible over the internet. You could do the same thing with Open Web RX as well. I myself have an email tonight. So it is so. It is so. And this one comes from Larry, KD6NSA. And Larry wrote he found an oscilloscope on eBay for a good price, he thinks. He just wants my input if this is something to start out with uh, to use on his ham radio setup to check, like, modulation from a mic or other things. Uh, he'd like to learn a little bit about oscilloscopes. 
and just wanted to know if this is a good place to start. 7-3, my friend. I have seen those GW scopes. They are less expensive scopes. I've never actually used one. I've just seen them advertised. Can't really say if it's a good starter or not. I mean, it looks like it is if the price is right. That's what I'm thinking, but I don't know what the price was. Have any of you used those before or got uh, any experience with them? I have not. Not that model, but I'm curious whether or not it has a Z input on it. That's kind of handy for, uh, for for doing a lot of hand monitoring type stuff. I don't know. It depends on what the price is. You can find used oscilloscopes, though, at just about every ham fest now. So, you know, that would be another good place to possibly look. It does have a Z-axis input. It does. Oh, there you go. You can use that as a good uh, tuning scope. I used to hook up my oscilloscope to my PK-232 for tuning in RTTY. It's great for that. You get these crosshairs, and when you're tuned right in, you get this little circle right in dead center when you're tuned in. Well, you know, tonight I went to the closet, <laughs> and the only wardrobe I could find was this purple shirt right here. And while it is comfortable, it's not like what you've got You're on there. You're not representing. I'm not representing. Like the rest of the gang. Well, oh, Neil's not representing tonight. He normally is. Oh, there he goes. Okay. He had to wrestle it back from the dog. So, so, <laughs> so I'm I'm completely out of wardrobe here. How could I get in the wardrobe? Look, look I think I'm gonna. I'm going to send you an email with a link. Yeah, you're not in uniform. Shop.spreadshirt.com forward slash amateur logic, and you can get caps similar to what Mike and Emil have. You can get shirts similar to what I've got, T-shirts, hoodies, uh, backpacks, cups, mugs, all kind of good stuff. So anyway, go check it out at shop.spreadshirt.com forward slash amateur logic. Okay. There's also some ham college stuff in there as well. Yeah. I could use more good stuff. I know, right? Instead of having to wear a little purple shirt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, yeah, and probably uh, many of you know it, maybe not everyone, so we'll mention this as well. We started a new series of videos here just recently, you know, because we only do uh, Amateur Logic once a month and Ham College once a month. So we're filling in the blanks with Amateur Logic shorts. So the weeks that we don't have... Uh, but they're not the kind of shorts you get from the swag shop. No, they don't have them in the swag shop yet. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you could take a marker and make your own, but uh, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. It's uh, basically every other week we've got a short video that we're posting out there, and a segment like you might see on Amateur Logic, the regular episodes, except it's only going to be available on YouTube, so you'll have to watch it there if you'd like to see it. We'd encourage you to go check them out. We've had some good topics lately, uh, some that, well, I, I've done, all of us have done yeah, at least done one some. or more of those by now. A recent one that I did was of that new ICOM A8705 tuner, the one that goes perfectly with the IC705 rig. Yes, I've ordered the warranty on it right there on Worldwide Internet Television. This one, I've forgotten what it was called. I think it was unboxing the A8705 one screw at a time. Kind of interesting to see what was inside of it. There's a lot packed in that little tuner. And, you know, there's other things you might want to see inside of as well, like maybe what's in, uh, you know, one of these newfangled battery packs. Or an old fangled battery pack that you wanted to steal the cells out of. And you did that for the last short. I uh, showed how to get some uh, free or nearly free batteries and how to use them in your project. Showed some good little components in there. Mm -hmm. He almost made me go buy a lithium-ion battery charger. And I don't even have any single cells <laughs> like that. But well, that was that wasn't the point of the segment. But it is a pretty cool charger. It uh, showed a charger that I found that you can actually kind of revive those uh, flat cells. You know, once those lithium ion batteries get dead, it's kind of hard to charge them back up. So not just any charger will do it. 
That's true. And you want to be real careful. You don't want to put them on just any charger. No, you either. certainly don't. So that, that was a great one. I almost bought one of those, Tommy. When I looked at that segment, I was looking at that charger thinking, man, I'm going to click it. I'm going to click it. But I, I, I have the, uh, the cheap device on my mouse. It's two, a uh, North Pole of a magnet and a North Pole <laughs> on my a little finger thing I wear. So it's like a, you try to click, but it won't uh, let you. It repels it, it every time. Yeah. This actually is a pretty inexpensive battery charger, considering. Yeah. Where, did you find that at Amazon, or where yeah, did you did. find it? Cool. I'll be probably be doing uh, some kind of a little segment on it sometime coming up about the rest of the functions in it. It's a nice tool to have. It's it saved me several times. Yeah. Yeah. It um it charges uh, nickel cadmium and um, mm -hmm. nickel metal hydrides as well. Yeah. I think all the way up yeah. to the C size. Oh. I have the two cell version of that hey. same charger. Uh huh. The thing that impressed me about it is it allowed you to test the cells too. Uh -huh. Right, and that's that's exactly what I bought it for, primarily for that function. Yeah. So I've got some laptop batteries I'd like to explore, and I could have a bad cell in there. That's where I got most of my. Um, what are they? One eighty six fifties. Eighteen six fifty, yeah. Or eighteen six fifty. 50s, right? Um, oh, out of uh, old laptop batteries. Well, we've got something else going on that we started a little over a year ago now that's become pretty popular. As a, as a matter of fact, well, why don't you tell us about it, Tommy? Well, when the uh, the COVID stuff hit and everybody kind of got grounded and and uh, sequestered to stay at home, we. Actually, Mike came up with the idea of doing a net, and uh, so we kind of pursued it, and we've got the Amateur Logic Soundcheck net. Happens every Tuesday night, as you can see, 8 p.m. Central or 100 UTC right now, until the time changes next time. Uh, but it's a multi-mode net, and uh, it's got a lot of different modes there, a lot of different ways to connect. Uh, they're all tied together, and uh, you're encouraged to check in with multiple modes, uh, Test out your gear. It's a lot of fun. We usually have a question uh, every net. Actually, we do have a question every net, and uh, most time it's ham radio related. It's always fun, and uh, that way you can have a little bit more input. And you know, it's it's just very interesting. If you have uh, some free time on Tuesday night, come check it out. Yeah, it is a lot of fun, and uh, one of our net controls from well, this past Tuesday night is in the chat room tonight. Amanda's in there. Yeah. Uh, Tom is in there as well. He's one of the net controls, as as well as everybody you see right here. The four of us on the screen. But anyway, come join us for it. It's it's a lot of fun. If you uh, check it out one time, there's a good chance you'll be back the following week as well. You can check us out, facebook.com slash group slash amateurlogic.tv. Yep, follow us on Twitter at amateurlogic. Or at me, we dot com under join amateur logic tv or groups.io slash g slash amateur logic so, so there know, you have it yeah check in uh, one or more of those we always post when the next episode will be shot live in case you'd like to check out the live stream and one other thing you might want to check in if you want to know what was in each episode and what links go with the particular segments in there. The best place to do that is the amateurlogic.tv wiki, amateurlogic.tv slash wiki. So with that, I think we've got another one almost in the can or in the tanker, however you want to <laughs> look at it. Uh, and we'll be back uh, around the 15th of next month. We'll have another Ham College coming up at the end of this month. And guess what? Next week, well, it'll be an Amateur Logic short. Yeah, so be sure and go subscribe to the YouTube channel so you don't miss those shorts. Yeah. So before we get out of here, Tommy, any final thoughts for tonight? No, it's been fun. It's uh, It was great to be back here on set mm -hmm. and... Uh, Looking forward to the next one. Yeah, it's like my neck had gotten stiff because I hadn't been, you know, like doing like this. Yeah. For over a year. Yes, yeah, that was must have been all that crunching I heard. It, it probably was. <laughs> Email. What about from down there? Well, I'll, what I'm going to say 
is I hope to see y'all in field day, oops, this year. And I hope to hear some of you on the air. And I'll be out there with my little uh, dongle setting the time and doing some digital and other modes. We're going to try to hit some of those points this year out in the field. So we got a little time before then, but I uh, figured I'd just throw it out there. Okay. So whether or not you make any contacts, you will be punctual. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Mike, what about up there? Is the snow gone now? And what's uh, The snow's like? all gone, and I actually uh, mowed the lawn for the first time this year. Uh, on uh, last weekend, and um, I do I do have a, a project that's underway. It's it's not ham related, but it's kind of interesting. Um, I'm converting a couple of bikes into e-bikes. So oh. uh, if you don't hear from me, um, you know, in the next few days, then something went terribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I would think you want to make sure you use the right charger for that. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's usually the RC guys, I think, that um, that have the mishaps because they're ordering cells as opposed to actual battery packs. Um, I know uh, I mentioned Cousin Jerry. He's a big uh, RC airplane flyer, and um, he, he can tell you all kinds of stories where there's been fires created. Um, there was one down in, in Florida where he vacations at, and um, um, I think it burnt. It, it started in the garage, and they were out of the house for a year over that fire, and there was one up my way, uh, same same idea, where uh, a battery was left unattended being yeah, charged. Yeah, and, that's uh, those, lipos, they, those lipos. Those lipos, they can be kind of unstable. You got to use soap. He, he, Cousin Jerry gave me a good uh, tip, though. Uh, he says when you charge those things, uh, put them in a clay pot. Yeah, they also make a charging bag for them that, uh, that you yeah. can put them in. Yeah, I saw I saw one of those uh, for sale. It, it came in a pop up, but I was a little leery about a fabric bag being kind of fireproof. And mm. if it was fireproof, how much asbestos was in it? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> either way, I think it's yeah. a lose lose situation. I think I'll go with the. The clay pot, it's it's more calm compliant anyway. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a good idea. And make sure you're using the, a proper charger for those. I mean, yeah, you, and the proper rate. Yeah. You yeah. can't just go throwing voltage from a power supply. Yeah. Another big thing is don't leave them fully charged and store them like that. You need to run them down to about 50% before you put them up. Really? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're the highest maintenance battery. Like, people used to complain about the memory effect with NICAD batteries, but I'll tell you, LiPos, they require so much more attention than there, yeah, there's no memory. There's no memory with them, but you do have to be kind of careful with them. And, yeah, uh, for sure. Like most of your chargers, like the ones for my drones uh, that use those, uh, have a, uh, a storage mode. So if you don't use them, you can put them on, back on the charger and put it in storage, and it'll trickle it down to the right voltage, and then you can put it away. Yeah. Well, I think that's going to do it for this episode. It's been fun being with everyone tonight. and uh, Go check out those shorts as well and have college. You mean these shorts? No, not no. Keep keep those under the table there. <laughs> that's <laughs> too much information. <laughs> so, all right. 7-3, everyone. Yep, 7-3, Seven three, everybody. Three. Thanks for being with us. Email, you're mighty quiet. Uh-oh. Am I quiet still? Yeah. How about now? Oh, we hear you now. Okay. <laughs> you didn't say your name. <laughs> I'm Emil. 
Okay. 